G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for my thoughts on the round three that was. It was a great round of footy, um, some exciting results, another terrible round of tipping for me, uh, but that kind of speaks to the fact that it has been a tough, uh, you know, opening three rounds to predict what's going to happen. Uh, we've seen some teams far exceed expectations. We've seen some teams we expected to be good falter quite poorly this year. And in addition to that, we had two big rivalry games in the showdown and the derby, which were hot games, high scoring in some aspects. Obviously, I might be talking about the Western Derby review in this particular video, guys. So if you are interested in my thoughts on that game, I did record a standalone video, uh, which should already be up on the channel, uh, provided things didn't go wrong. So in today's video, we're going to talk about the other eight games and uh, who did well, who didn't, and all of the interesting narratives that came out of round three. Thanks for all your support, guys. We are now six days or seven days until I fly out to America. I really appreciate everyone getting around the channel lately. It does appear that 40% of you who watch the videos have not subscribed though. So if I could just get you to hit that subscribe button, we'd be much appreciated. We're trending in the wrong direction. It's all good. I do appreciate the support regardless, but it'd be really helping me out if you hit subscribe. So the round kicked off with uh, a big clash between the Bulldogs and the Brisbane Lions at Marvel Stadium. This was kind of a game that was almost a bit of a must win for both sides uh, for different reasons. The Dogs were winless going into this game and the Lions um, had fired one shot and misfired badly in round one. So I expected a good game. The Lions uh, went in as favorites I would imagine and I did tip the Lions but the Dogs came through in a way that I somewhat expected. I did expect a response coming and this was the week they were able to pull it off. It was really tense tough battle this game. It was a real war of attrition. Very very low scoring. In fact the lead never actually got out past 15 points to the Dogs way during this game as well. It was a really messy defensive game uh, which was interesting considering both sides are capable of playing some exciting footy but perhaps it was just a symptom of this game being so important and so tense throughout out as well. The Dogs got the better of the midfield battle in this game um, through, you know, Liberatore, Bontempelli, McRae and Trelaw, the, the usual suspects delivered for the Dogs through the midfield. And ultimately, the biggest difference between the sides is that the Dogs had Jamara Ugulhagen, who was able to deliver some end product, be able to deliver on the opportunities, kicking five goals. He was a standout key forward in this game. And it's good to get even more glimpses of this guy's potential. I think he was a little bit criticized early in his career. He's got a couple of bags of five at the highest level now, and he's showing that good linear improvement for a guy that's 197 centimeters. He's playing pretty well for his age already. I think the biggest thing the Lions will brew from this loss was their inability to take the most of their opportunities. So they went into halftime, two goals, nine, 21. For them, in terms of who contributed, their recruits were solid. Josh Dunkley's obviously playing his first game against the Bulldogs uh, since joining the Brisbane Lions. You could tell it was a bit of an emotional one for him. He looked pretty dejected uh, when the Dogs ended up winning this game by 14 points, but he was solid in a return game with 24 possessions, and I think he had six tackles as well. And Gunston was a bit of a live wire for the Lions as well, kicking a couple of difficult set shots. He ended the game with three overall. But it was kind of a combination of the fact that the Lions were both inaccurate in front of goal, but you also factor in some of the delivery inside 50 was wasn't super consistent for them as well. So the Dogs walk away with this game, breathing some life into their season. It was an important win to go 0-3 would have been devastating for a side that should well and truly not only be competing for finals, but internally should be thinking, we're not that far off the premiership pace. That's the, what they should be aiming for. So this was a really important win for them. And the Lions, on the other hand, now sit in an awkward 1-2. and two. While this wasn't a terrible performance, it was certainly a winnable away game in their 0-2 away from home this year. The next game of the round was one of the more hotly anticipated ones, where Collingwood got the chocolates again by 14 points over the Richmond Footy Club. Another low-scoring tussle, another game where its sides were inaccurate in front of goal. On the plus side, though, Richmond are a tough opponent, and this was a really gritty performance by the Pies, who now go 3-0. and And uh, you, you have to say, having watched the game, they probably could have won this game by even more. So much so that in the first half, they had 13-4 to four scoring shots, uh, but I think they went into halftime with three goals. Ten in Richmond were one goal, three. So while Richmond are a tough opponent, they certainly left some goals on the table, you'd have to say, and probably could have put this game to bed. They kind of left the door open going into the second half, and that's where Richmond came back. The Tigers really just struggled to generate inside 50s in this game. We saw Shai Bolton open the scoring with uh, with a fantastic goal. Uh, it was the first goal of the game, but that would be the only goal they'd kick in the first half. And they only generated 40 inside 50s. That's West Coast Eagles numbers. A headache out of this game for the Pies will be that Darcy Cameron, uh, who's been playing as a lone ruck for them, got injured. I believe it's on the minor side in terms of knee injuries, but he's going to be out for a couple of weeks. We did see Nankervis uh, really get a hold of the hit-out situation, and Richmond were able to win a lot of the clearances, but again, weren't able to convert that into meaningful inside 50. So other than the usual suspects doing their job through the midfield, you know, Tom Mitchell had 30-odd, I think, and uh, Jordan Degoe had 35 possessions and three behinds. One thing they'll take out of this game is that Billy Frampton did a good job. They knew 
recruit their tall defender. They did a pretty good job on Tom Lynch, restricting him to one goal three. But again, it was also a symptom of the fact that Richmond just couldn't get the ball inside 50. While this wasn't the most polished Collingwood performance, the fact that they overcame a, a tough side in Richmond who have had a solid start to the year. And again, we're talking about a team that's probably going to feature in September. Collingwood continue to be the form team of the competition, especially when you consider they could have won by more. Brisbane at the Gabba next week will be a fascinating contest. Next, we travel to Tasmania where Hawthorne took on North Melbourne. And the interesting aspect of this game was the battle between Sam Mitchell and his former master, Alistair Clarkson. Some real Star Wars shit. Hawks ended up getting the job done by 19 points in this game, which is a great win considering their pretty poor start to the season. We, I was expecting a Hawthorne performance like this at some point, and generally games in Tasmania against bottom half sides are a good candidate for that, but I will admit I tipped North Melbourne. And of course, it didn't help that Luke Davies Uniac was a laid out for this game, and Jai Simpkin as well missed through suspension. That's where North kind of got exposed, but there was plenty to like about this game from a Hawthorne perspective. With those two guys out, they won the clearances 43-24 to with the young midfield that I talked about a lot in this preseason. And on top of that, they had 80 more disposals, beating them on the inside and the outside in this game. James Sicily and uh, Dylan Moore were typically influential. Dylan Moore is becoming a, uh, quite a consistent gun. Uh, but on top of that, I'm keeping my eye on this evolution of Will Day as a midfielder. And he had 29 possessions and five clearances as well. So the Ruse, without their two gun on ballers, uh, really struggled to get their hands on the foot in fact, Ben Cunnington with his 21 disposals had the most possessions on the field by any North Melbourne midfielder. He did win seven clearances himself, which is his role, but this is where North Melbourne got exposed. Harry Sheasel again, I mention him in every video because he gives me something to talk about. Uh, he was fantastic, particularly in that third term. I think he had 10 touches in that third term, which sort of sparked a bit of a North Melbourne resurgence. He was certainly active throughout that period and he ended the game with uh, 26 disposals, I think, which was the most of any North Melbourne player in this game. Cam Zerha was also prominent for the Brews. He had a couple of goals and 20 possessions in this game, but ultimately too much was left on the shoulders of too few without uh, you know two of their best players in LDU and Simpkin. Is this the start of a new little chapter here in Hawthorne season? I'm not too sure, to be honest. There are notoriously inconsistent sides since they've become so young. So we'll see, but they must be happy with a 19-point win over a side that went into this game 2-0. Then we travel up to New South Wales where GWS uh, got undone by Carlton by 10 points in this game. And pleasingly for Carlton, it's another close game in which they walk away with the four points, which was not the story towards the end of last year, of course. But that's two weeks in a row. Carlton uh, overcome a thrilling contest to win, even if the opponent this week wasn't as strong as last week. That being said, had they been more efficient in this game, they certainly would have won by more. They kicked nine goals, 20. And I think there was a patch in the third term where they had 15 inside 50s and walked away with just five behinds and no goals. So it wasn't the most polished performance from Carlton, but ultimately their ability to get the four points in these tough games that can shape your season if you win or lose them is very, very pleasing. It was also a pretty spirited Giants performance. They've certainly shown themselves to not be easy beats this year so far, and at the end of the day, four points is four points. It was an interesting battle of the midfield in this game. Patrick Cripps was monstrous. He had 42 possessions, 13 clearances, and went to head-to-head -head with Tom Green of the GWS Footy Club, and Doherty was also prominent. He had one of his most uh, prolific games for a while, 39 disposals, and a goal. And it was a pretty strong Giants midfield that they went up against as well with Kelly and Whitfield available for this game. Tom Green in particular, Josh Kelly had 30 disposals. Whitfield came back and had 27 off the top of my head. There was solid resistance in this game, but Carlton just proved to be a little bit better for longer. One of the big highlights from a Carlton perspective in this game was Nick Newman's job on Toby Green, who's obviously been super dangerous in the opening uh, th two rounds of the season. Kicked uh, three against West Coast, four against Adelaide. And in this game, Newman held him to just the five touches and uh, one goal while Newman had 24 possessions himself. So that would have gone a long way to winning the game when you consider it was only 10 points in the end. It wasn't a game that was particularly conducive to tall forwards doing well, but Charlie Curnow still featured, kicked a brilliant goal on the run uh, earlier in the game and then finished with the sealer as well. So while it wasn't a statement win for the Blues as such, I think this was a really important one for them just to get over the line and continue this form of winning those close games. Then we headed back to Marvel Stadium where St Kilda got the job done over Essendon by 18 points. This was another intriguing contest too sides that have a new coach who went into this game 2-0 and two sides that I openly was a little bit unsure about where to place this season. They went head-to-head -head in a revealing contest and of course St Kilda got the chocolates in this game and uh, St Kilda are now 3-0 for the first time since 2010, a year where they, they made the grand final and drew it and then got annihilated in the replay. And while it remains 
to be seen, you know, the quality of the opponents that they've beaten so far. You can only beat the teams in front of you. And I think we've seen a lot of good signs from Ross Lyon's team now, particularly when you consider how much quality is still to come back into the St. Kilda footy lineup. Early in the game, they looked like they were going to put the contest to bed. They led 34-0. But to Essendon's credit, they came back hard and the score was actually level uh, in the last quarter thanks to that Jai Cold War burst where he kicked two amazing goals. In the clinches and in the midfield stakes, this is where Essendon actually got the better of St. Kilda. Darcy Parrish was, uh, you know, prolific again through the midfield. Dylan Shield was also impactful, a couple of goals and 22 possessions. But the Saints were just a little bit more efficient, a little bit more polished, and their smalls got a hold of this game as well. Dan Butler and Jack Higgins kicking four goals each. Lots been said about Mason Wood as well, who was a delisted free agent from the North Melbourne Footy Club. These delisted free agents can be very hit and miss. We saw one become an All-Australian last year in Tyson Stengel. And Mason Wood's quietly put together a very good opening three weeks of the season. And this game was probably his best game yet, with 27 possessions and a goal for the Saints as well. It was an interesting game of um, ebbs and flows. And St Kilda largely won this game off the back of two devastating bursts of five goals. So they kicked the first five goals of the game. Then later on, they got a run of five goals in a row as well to ultimately put the contest to bed. For the Dons, I still think we are seeing evidence of, of growth under Brad Scott as well, even though they didn't get the win in this game. It remains to be seen how formidable St Kilda are. Um, we're still a while off knowing exactly where they're going to sit in the pecking order. But in addition to Parrish and Shield, you know, Josh Kelly was also really influential down back and Massimo D'Ambrosio as well had his best game at AFL level with 27 possessions as well. So I think they're tracking along pretty nicely, even if they didn't get the win this week. We're seeing an evolution of this side under Brad Scott. Hey guys, I just want to interrupt this video for one a brief moment to talk to you a little bit about Druzy's Athlete Academy. We're now in partnership with the True Footy YouTube channel as well. So if you're not aware, my good friend Druzy has launched his own online strength and conditioning coaching business. The service that he provides is online one-on-one -on -one coaching directed at young athletes who are trying to take their game to the next level. Drews has gone and got qualified as a sports scientist and now he can provide professional strength and conditioning coach for anyone looking to take their fitness game to the next level. Whether you're a young prospective athlete who wants to level up, who wants to get drafted or potentially, you know, play another sport to a very, very high level, your strength and conditioning is so central to that and Drewsy can give you personalized programs tailored to your specific needs. But it's not just for athletes. If you're just someone who wants to get into the gym or perhaps has been going to the gym for a while and has started to stagnate, the benefit of Drewsy's Athlete Academy is that because he's a qualified sports scientist, you can take out all the guesswork and you can get personalized programs to help you fulfill whatever your goals are. There's running programs, there's gym beginner programs, there's muscle bulk programs. I know personally for me, I started getting into the gym about 10 years ago. I was a skinny little rat and some might say I'm still a skinny rat, but regardless, bulking up, getting a bit of muscle, feeling confident in my own fitness was the best thing I ever did. And I know that there's a huge correlation between how good I'm feeling in my general well-being and how strong and fit I'm feeling as well. So with the partnership you have through True Footy, you can get 20% off on any program at Drewsy's Athlete Academy. You simply just have to use the code TRUEFOOTY20 at checkout on the website. So do go check out the website. The link for that is in the description. And remember, you get 20% off and you'll be investing in yourself. So it would be money well spent. Then we got the showdown, and this was one of the more interesting results of the round. I was pretty confident of a Port Adelaide win without disrespecting Adelaide, but obviously you look at the respective form lines and Port Adelaide had been Jekyll and Hyde in round one and two, and Adelaide had probably put in two disappointing results compared to where you know they were fancied to be at this early part of the season. But the Crows delivered on that preseason promise that they showed that I certainly bought into, and it happened in the best way possible. When you beat your arch rivals in a good, high-scoring game, much like the derby that I've already talked about, uh, this was a cracking start to the game. 11 goals in the opening term, and it was very, very entertaining, exactly what you want to see in a big showdown. It was a fierce contest throughout. It was pretty much neck and neck. The power actually hit the lead in the last quarter before the Crows stalled home with the final six goals of the game. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, Adelaide's young core that they're building here. And Riley Dillthorpe is probably a little bit understated for how good he actually is for being, you know, a, a ruckman size key forward. I know he was picked two, but he's kicked his second bag of five goals at AFL level. I don't think there's been a third, but I do remember one other one. So for him to be impacting like he is at AFL level already is quite impressive for a guy that in theory should take a long while to come on. And Rankin, the recruit from last year, kicks four goals in this game. He's really showing evolution again. We've seen linear improvement for him. He had a good year. I think it was last year he kicked 36 goals and he's on track to do that again this year. But some other young guys that are a little bit unheralded outside of maybe South Australia even. Uh, Luke Pedler kicked three goals. Saligo looks like a good young midfielder as well. Josh Rochelle, we already know how good he is. He was prominent in this game. And Michael Annie as well. Uh, obviously their father-son pick in last year's draft. They traded heavily out of the draft to land Rankin, but they recruited Michael Annie through the father-son system and, and he's looking really, really eye-catching already as well. 
So to contrast the promise we saw from Adelaide, this was a pretty devastating loss from a Port Adelaide perspective. You know, after round one, they annihilated one of the, the premiership favorites going into this season when you consider best 22 strength. Brisbane were right up there. Port Adelaide put them to the sword. But in two weeks in a row, they've conceded massive scores against. 117 in this game, 134 last week against Collingwood. I was prepared to write off the Port Adelaide game as a bit of an aberration, but this particular result is very, very concerning. They were just outgunned by the Crows. They conceded 10 more inside 50s. They were beaten on the outside. Adelaide had 88 marks around the ground to Port Adelaide's just 63. And you have to look at the pressure on Ken Hinckley right now. In addition to losing a winnable game, it's not just that. They've lost to their arch rivals in Adelaide as well. So the media pressure I'd expect would really, really ramp up on Ken Hinckley at the moment. Can they turn around? I think absolutely. But perhaps they're not quite the outside contender for the flag that I thought they might have been after round one. It's a long season yet. It's only round three. Uh, we'll see what happens. Then you got another surprising result from the Sunday set of fixtures where the Gold Coast Suns got the job done over the Geelong Footy Club. It was a bit of a stunning result. And I, I say that without meaning that Gold Coast were incapable of beating Geelong. I certainly thought they were they had the tools to do so. But when you factor in Geelong go into this game in 0-2, it's not quite season on the line stuff, but it's the season's getting away from them. And now they're 0-3, having lost this game by 19 points in the end. And they're the first reigning Premier to do so in 47 years. The Suns had plenty of positive narratives out of this game, none more so than Jack Lacocious, a player that I've always really, really liked. Been shifted into a, a sort of new role up forward and kicked a career best five goals. But it was the, I think it was was his fifth or fourth goal um, which kicked that they measured actually went 73 meters and the incredible part about it was that it was the drop punt he went back I thought he was time wasting and he absolutely bombs this massive drop punt well and truly over the line from inside the center square amazing stuff it was in the clinches where Gold Coast really got on top, and we know that they have a really strong inside midfield, in particular with Matty Rao. He led the way with 24 possessions, 18 of which were contested. So this guy's an absolute animal for the contest. I would like to see him win a little bit more ball on the outside, and that's where he'd be hitting those 30 to 35 numbers. But he's getting in there and winning the hard ball for the Gold Coast Suns, and he had nine clearances in this game. And I think Miller and Anderson had seven each, and they won the clearances 40 to 23. That's an absolute smashing. Ben King looked a little bit rusty in this game, but he took a sensational mark, ended up not kicking in the goal. It deserves a goal, but he continues his reintroduction into the league after that ACL, and him and Lukosius, having Lukosius there as another aerial threat, that really adds another dimension to the Gold Coast forward line. It really takes a bit of pressure off Ben King if Lukosius can be a consistent threat on goal. For the Cats, Jeremy Cameron is, is putting together a really, really good season. It has to be said, even though they're 0-3, he's been valiant in some of their defeats. He kicked three goals again in this game, had 15 possessions. We saw Tom Stewart surprisingly come back from injury early. He had 30 touches. Dangerfield battled hard, but across the board, goal Coast were just far too good in this game. There was an unfortunate injury from this game as well, Sam DeConing as well, with a nasty head clash. Uh, I presume he's going to be out through the concussion protocols. So going into next week's game against Hawthorne at Easter Monday, you think they don't go 0-4. And if they do, it's probably curtains. I would be concerned about 0-3 if it wasn't Geelong and their ability to come home strong with a wet sail and potentially really mix things up from 5th or 6th this year. I think they're good enough to do that. But next week is absolutely must win, which is not a position they want to be in this far into the season. The final game of the round that we'll talk about, of course, the Derby is in its standalone video, is Melbourne versus Sydney at the MCG. And this game was a real statement win from a Melbourne perspective, getting the job done by 50 points over Sydney, who were, of course, the runners-up last year. And, and importantly, started the year uh, looking like they were up there as being one of the form sides of the competition. Two big wins over Gold Coast and Hawthorne. But again, this was their first real test, first trip to the MCG. And when you factor in, they've beaten Melbourne twice in a row at the MCG. I gave Sydney a red-hot chance. In fact, I tipped them. So for Melbourne to get the job done by 50 points in this game, that's a massive statement. The Ds jumped out of the blocks really early in this game with a 28-point lead at quarter time. The Swans did rally, but ultimately at the end, Melbourne kicked away and they were just the better team on the day. Oliver and Petrarca were ranked one and two on the field. Uh, what an absolute surprise that is. But uh, what some of the other takeaways from the Demons would be Grundy without Gorn, who's of course got that knee injury. He had 25 hitouts, 21 disposals, four clearances. This is a really good opportunity for him to find a niche in this side as the sole Ruckman. But it was the debutant Jacob Van Ruyen, who, uh, who came out of the blocks and kicked three goals. I think he kicked the second goal of the game. He's looking like an excellent talent, which is just what we need. A side like Melbourne having a gun key forward talent in their side. But to kick three goals on debut as a tall player, I think he's about 197 centimeters, maybe a little bit shorter than that. That really bodes well for him and the Demons. For the Swans, this was a really disappointing 
return to the crime scene. That was the 2022 grand final where they went back to the G and to get rolled by 50 points, it's a far from ideal result. But again, it's a long season and it's an away game against one of the best teams in the competition, I'd imagine. I think Melbourne and Sydney could be right up there deep into the season with Collingwood. They're probably the three best sides in the competition. So this could be a bit of a mental blow, but ultimately I think they can shrug this result off. We did see Papley kick three goals, including a brilliant snap. Uh, Mills was typically good. Jake Lloyd fought hard. But again, the D's won all the important stats in this game and it was a comprehensive victory. All right, guys, that wraps up my thoughts on round three. Let me know in the comments what were your some of you. All right, guys, that wraps up my thoughts on round three. Let me know in the comments some of your thoughts. What were your takeaways from this round? Uh, what do you agree with? What do you disagree with? This week, uh, we've got nine things I learned coming out soon from Druzy that will probably be up tomorrow as I record this. Um, I'm also going to do a power rankings video this week. I normally do those every five rounds, but I thought it'd be interesting to do one before I go away to America uh, because there's been such a mix up of, uh, of the perceptions around some teams. It'll be an interesting one to do this early in the season. But I appreciate all your support, guys. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.